Hello, my name is Wade Nomura, and this is Rotary Serving Our Community. I recently had a chance and opportunity to catch up with uh, International Pro Vice President Jennifer Jones, who actually became the second woman uh, Vice President in Rotary history. The first one was Ann Matthews, the second one, uh, Jennifer Jones, and currently we also have another Vice President woman. So there's been three in recent years. Kind of a trend that is very interesting, and one of the reasons I wanted to catch up with Jennifer is to find out, you know, what's, what the trend is all about and whether or not we're going to see change in the leadership of Rotary International. I wanted to give you a little background on how I got to meet Jennifer because um, it was quite an, an interesting and fascinating trip that I took uh, to get to know her quite well. To start with, um, I've got a few pictures. Starting with the first picture I have is a picture of Mackinac Island. Um, each year, the international president is required to attend 535 district conferences around the world. Every conference, every district has to have at least one conference during that time. And because the president, it's impossible for him to do uh, 535, they send out representatives, selected individuals that will serve to represent the international president. Now, what's unique about this, uh, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to be able to do this uh, at least this one time, and this one here was to Mackinac Island. I was told by uh, President Ron Burton that uh, it's quite a special assignment and didn't know what he was talking about until I got there and found out that the uh, director, incoming director, was Jennifer Jones from this specific district. The next picture I have is a picture of how we were greeted on Mackinac Island. Now, Mackinac Island being, is, is fascinating because they do not allow cars on the island. This uh, conference was uh, scheduled for May 8th, and on May 8th, um, I'm sorry, on May 5th, they actually did not know for sure if they were going to be able to hold it there because of the snow that they had, the snowpack. But uh, the ice fro uh, thawed out, and we were able to get out there. We were greeted by horses uh, on buggies because there were no cars allowed, so the horses and the wagons actually took us up to the uh, Grand Hotel. The next picture you have is a picture of the Grand Hotel, which, um, to be honest with you, that was the first time I ever spent an evening or any time at a Grand Hotel. Uh, heard about them, couldn't believe how much, uh, how impressive they actually were. Those things are huge. The next picture is a picture of uh, how we were greeted at the hotel itself. Um, the lady on the left of my wife, Roxanne, is Donna Schmidt. She was the current governor. And, uh, great lady. We got to be very good friends. Uh, we will actually be doing a number of projects together. And the lady on uh, the left is actually uh, Sue Goodson, who is um, the governor-elect at that time, who has now served as a governor. And her husband, past district governor Bruce, and I uh, also became good friends. And so we run into each other fairly regularly on a, and uh, always a good time. The next picture I have is a, a picture of a gentleman that's an Elvis impersonator. <laughs> You're wondering, why would I put a picture of an Elvis impersonator on, on the show? Well, the fascinating part was, as a president's representative, your job is to motivate and try and create interest in Rotary, um, and that includes recruiting people. Well, Elvis here was um, a spouse of a Rotarian, and he came to me at the end of uh, one of my presentations and said, you wouldn't believe this, but he goes, uh, I've, my wife's been Rotarian for quite a long time. I had no idea what Rotary was all about until now. And um, I've decided to join Rotary. So um, part of the credit that I got for that trip was I actually recruited Elvis to Rotary. <laughs> Why well, I put the picture there. The next picture is a picture um, of us leaving. Um, myself, my wife, Roxanne, and um, the governor at that time, Donna, along with Jennifer Jones and her husband, Nick. And we got to spend some time together. And at this time in spending it together, I found out how genuine Jennifer was. Uh, her and Nick are great people. And to be honest with you, uh, with her leading Rotary as a vice president and also as a director, uh, Rotary was in very good hands. And with that, I would like to jump in now to the interview because Jennifer gives us a lot of insight, an insight on a lot of questions why women aren't involved with Rotary, why they don't take leadership positions, or why they aren't appointed to these. And uh, Jennifer's insight is quite fascinating. I think you'll enjoy it. So in enjoy it. Thank you. Well, welcome, Jennifer, and thanks for joining us. Well, thanks, Wade. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, personal life, what you've done. And... Sure. Um, well, I live in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. 
I own a television production company, and uh, we do a little bit of public relations as well. And uh, that's uh, actually I formed the company about 22, 23 years ago, and I can't believe that that much time has gone by. It's <laughs> it's, it's kind of time time has that way of, of moving quickly. Um, married, I uh, we don't have any children. I have a dog that thinks she's a child. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, but my husband Nick and I we um, we love to travel. We love Rotary. We love our Rotary friends. Sure. And um, yeah, we we uh, we really get a lot of um, participating in our in the wonderful things our organization does. Great, great. And how did you get involved with Rotary? Well, I had just formed my company. I was 27 years old, and uh, the local cable manager was a good friend of mine. And he uh, he said, you know, I really want you to come to a Rotary meeting and, and check it out. And a, cu a couple of years earlier, I actually was working as a radio reporter at the time, and I had covered Rotary meetings. So this would have been um, 85, 86 in, in that kind of time frame. Okay. And uh, anyway, when I was covering these meetings, it was it was the stereotype we're trying to break. <laughs> I mean, it was the, 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 the leaders of our community, certainly, but I found them to be very intimidating. And mm -hmm. it was, you know, just a lot of serious leaders that, that yeah, it was, it was cool to be in their presence, but it was like, oh, I'm not sure about this. So when he asked me to go, I wasn't really certain what I was going to expect, and so this is now several years later, and I walked in, and honestly, I felt like I'd come home, mm. and it was a great group of people. It was some that I recognized from the past, but it had diversified more. Um, there were certainly uh, there were women now in the club, um, as opposed to when I was first there as a reporter <laughs> when there wasn't. Um, and so, yeah, it just it felt like I came home. Great, great. And what year was that that you actually joined Rotary? Uh, 1996. 96. But you did get to see a glimpse of that in their early, mid-80s, you said. Yeah. Oh, yeah. interesting. And the size of your club is? We're at about uh, 53 right now. 53. Okay, so it's a comfortable size club. Yeah, yeah. And what was it specific that was so inviting to you that you, that you appreciated of that club? Well, first and foremost, I love the people. They, you know, very quickly they engaged me, and so much so that within the first couple of months, I was already chairing our big lobster fest. Wow. And, okay. um, you know, I at, at the time, I I remember feeling like, oh my gosh, like this is way too fast and way too much. But you know, that's one of the important things about membership is getting people engaged and getting people into something and getting your hands into something. And through that process, um, I certainly know that my leadership skills. Um, were uh, a little more defined and refined um, through that, having to work with uh, a large committee. Um, you know, this is a big event, 800 people, wow. one metric ton of, of lobsters. I mean, it was, <laughs> there was a lot of logistics to, to it definitely work through. Sounds that way. And, and I hadn't really, you know, I had done other events, but nothing at that scale at that point mm -hmm. in time. So yeah, it was, it was an opportunity to kind of, to grow. Okay. And, um, and, and I think that's an important message that we need to get out there that, you know, you don't need to let somebody sit there and just sort of figure things out. You need, we need to get them in right away into right. doing something and something meaningful. True. And the other benefit I see is what the benefit of the event actually was. And so the money that you fundraise for as Rotarians, we see where that money is going to go, how it's focused. So in this case, um, what was the money actually going towards as well, far as an effort? In, in the, uh, the three signature events that our club hosts, we um, have a, a little line on all of our advertisements that say proceeds support the charities of, or the charities of Windsor Roseland. Okay. And so that's my club, Windsor right. Roseland. Right. So that allows us to then take the, the collective pool and it's allocated out to a certain percentage for international projects, uh, certain for community projects different uh, pet project, we put uh, uh, $10,000 a year away just to the side um, wow. to try and every five years do something substantive. Okay. Um, so that kind of that kind of strategic thinking about it. Good. And then uh, an allocation committee sits down and, and reviews requests that come in and uh, the international committee obviously um, has projects that we're, our club is very internationally focused so we have a lot of our members who travel abroad and um, um, a lot of different things like that that, uh, you know, it's nice to be able to support. Very good, very good. Now, one thing I always ask, and I find it fascinating, the different stories, but tell us what your rotary moment was. If there's one that you oh had or if gosh. there's a few of them, we'd love to hear those. I probably have a bajillion rotary <laughs> moments that, 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 um, that I could tell you about. 
let me let me tell you this is a short this is a short one, um, but it was an enlightening little moment. And then I have another one. Okay, um, sounds good. Okay. This 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 was this just happened actually this year. I was in um, in Sweden at a, a Rotary Institute there where we were training incoming leaders, and there was a, a 29 year old Rotaractor who was there, and she um, she and I spoke several times throughout the conference, and she was just a real bright light, and. At the end, she um, she was up on stage, and her and another rotor actor were being interviewed as to what they you know what they got out of the conference and this kind of thing. And her her comment, and this it'll stay with me forever. She said, uh, you know, if you want to join a big organization, join Facebook. If you want to join a quality organization, you join Rotary. Wow. And I just thought in that wow. moment it was one of those kaboom. Yeah, that's Very that's true. that's exactly right. But to hear it from a twenty nine year old rotor actor. Yeah was so profound and and you know that's not necessarily um, the emotive story sometimes that we look at in terms of rotary moments because that's the kind of stuff that a lot of times um, we focus trying to share those kinds of stories so that people are impacted but that's one that was just kind of one of those moments like kaboom yeah but yeah. Um, let me let me share this one with you um, Last year, I had the wonderful opportunity to be a president's representative in Jordan. And uh, while we were there on the opening night, I was introduced to this doctor from Indianapolis, and um, uh, Dr. Mark. And he was there as part of the Gift of Life program. And Gift of Life is where they provide open heart surgery for uh, children that would not have the means to do this in any other kind of way. And so he was just a really lovely man. We chatted for a little bit. and. And uh, I had learned of the program, ironically, just about a week earlier. So it was really kind of neat to, to yeah. see somebody out in the field and in action. So fast forward to the end of the week. And uh, he uh, was starting the surgical rotation. And so the governor said to me, you know, Dr. Mark's starting today. Do you want to go to the hospital to go and see part of the mission? I said, well, of course. So, on our, you know, literally we were going to be heading to the airport in two hours. So we went and uh, quickly got into scrubs and... Next thing you know, I'm in the OR, wow. and and he's standing there looking over the patient. He's literally he's he's got a needle and he's stitching a patch, and all you can see is this square. Everything else is covered, and so you just see the, they right. don't see the face, none right. of the, no other parts of the body, and so just this little square. And he's with precision doing this, and I was just blown away. And I, w I wasn't breathing. Like, it was just kind of like, you know, and I was standing back and I was silent. And he looks up and he says, Jen, when did you come in? And I'm like, like I'm, I'm, I'm just going to stay right here. And he's like, no, come on over. Let me show you what I'm doing. So I get in close. And anyway, just, he was so meticulous. Yeah. And every once in a while, he would say to the anesthetist, okay, warm it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And um, he'd go back to doing this and warm it up a little bit. And then he finally did the last, the last stitch. And then he sort of put his hand in under the heart and, you know, jiggle it around a little bit to mm -hmm. make sure that there, there was no leaks or anything. Mm -hmm. At that point, he introduced me to the patient. It was six-month-old baby wow. Selma. Wow. And um, at that point, he looked at the anesthetist and he said, all right, warm it up. And at that moment, I watched her little heart start beating again. Wow. And I hadn't realized, as I was standing there watching him, with surgical precision doing what he was doing, I hadn't realized her heart was stopped. Sure. I mean, it sure. makes perfectly logical sense, of course. but I, at that moment, I wasn't really comprehending that. Mm -hmm. And watching her little heart beat and her little life come back. And anyway, wow. I went out into the hallway afterward, and sorry, I'm a little choked up. Um, <laughs> I went out into the hallway afterward and met her parents, mm -hmm. and um, they were Syrian refugees. And I got to say to them, she's going to be good. And she's going to run. She's going to play. And you know what? That day she got a break. That that is definitely a life changing right there. Yeah, amazing, absolutely. amazing story. Let's jump into your uh, Rotary leadership. Yes. Uh, you are now currently serving as Vice President of Rotary International. Tell us, um, did you ever have any ambitions or idea that you ever strive to be the under governor, be beyond a club president? Um, well, I think that um, anyone who's serving in any leadership role in our organization, I think it's fair to say that we're all ambitious. I mean, it's that's not a bad thing to, to look forward. And and I think probably the, the common denominator I see as well is that it is, it's almost more rewarding personally 
than it, you know than what you are able to give. It's it's what it does in here for you. For you, um, I will say one of the downsides, um, if I can be honest, about uh, this past two years of, of serving as a director and as vice president is I haven't had a lot of time to get into the field and get my hands oh. into service. And so I feel like I've been a little bit more administrative and, you know, out there speaking and motivating and, sure. and you know, getting people riled, riled up and excited about Rotary. Right. But personally, I haven't had my hands in something. And I'm looking forward to that. I, I can see that. Uh, of course, we know that the position is mostly administrative anyways. Mm -hmm. You're overseeing the broad organization. And like you said, you get your hands down and dirty, you just don't have time for that. Well, I mean, you you can make time to do it. It's just so. it's so it's it's it is a very uh, full um, portfolio, and so I I I've real I, I'm in saying that I could do this for the rest of my life. I've loved <laughs> I've loved this immensely, um, but uh, yeah, it's it, I'm looking forward to um, when my term finishes. Um, being back in my home club a little bit because I, I don't get a chance to go to many of That's those meetings and, and I miss them. I miss them. That is true. Tell us a little bit about uh, it's one of the uh, audience's favorites being a woman in Rotary and as a leader. Give us your perspective on that. Well, you know, one of the things that I think I feel most impressed by is I've never felt that. I've been treated as a woman at the leadership table. I feel like I've been treated as a Rotarian. And I think we've come a long way in, in that regard. The unfortunate part is um, we don't have a lot of women in our senior leadership. And I, you know, I, I don't think that you, I don't personally believe that we should be on a campaign to get more women onto the board. I believe we need to get the right people onto the board. Um, but we have an opportunity in front of us, and I think it's incumbent upon us to raise women up um, and and encourage them to run. In, in, to, and, and men too. This is not a, this is not a, a man male versus female kind of uh, way of thinking. But you know, the reason I feel very passionately about trying to trying to encourage and nur nurture other people into these roles is this year we have four women sitting on the board out of seventeen directors. Next year we have one. The year after that, zero. That can't be the face of our organization. And you know, so um, no patronage appointments. I mean, if we, you know, it's 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 like talking about, you know, when are we going to have a woman president? Well, you know what? When a qualified person puts their name in and is the right person at the right time. If we do that just to check a box, what a disservice that is to women at large. And so, I think that you know, it's it's. Ensuring that we're encouraging, as I said earlier, and really nurturing those relationships that I think is really fundamental. Very good. Uh, and I know John German said this as president, and being uh, the one person that appointed you, he said, without a doubt, you were of everybody the most qualified. And he wanted to make that a huge point. And uh, again, uh, definite bonus to you. And what you're saying echoes exactly what John's thinking. How would we get more women involved in the leadership roles? How do you see that working out? Well, I, I, let's let's even take it a step further and say um, diversity at large. Okay. Um, so women, age, ethnicity, color, right. gender, all all of the above. Um, people need to see themselves reflected in what they're seeing when they look at our organization. Mm -hmm. So, if we want more women in leadership, then we need to have women leaders for people to look toward mm -hmm. and. That be at a club, at a district level, at an international level. I think you know you need to see your faces reflected and say, "This looks like me. This looks like something I can belong to." And a young person needs to see that there's other younger members in a Rotary club that you know. And that's not necessarily about age. I really frame age from the perspective of mindset, and mm -hmm. that you know, we need young thinkers, not just young members. Right. And so. Because you know you can have a 24-year-old who's old, and you can have a 80-year-old who's really young, and right, right. you know it's it's marrying all of that demographic in between that is something that you know that young person needs to understand and see this means something to me. And yes, this person sitting next to me might be 60, 70, 80 years old, but I'm getting something out of this both ways that that cross mentorship. Right. 
Now, a lot of it, in, in your instance and a lot of the other senior leaders and leaders I've seen in Rotary, most of them are self-motivated. They, they, they see the big picture, they want, understand it, and they want to get involved to try and make those changes occur or happen. Opportunity-wise for you, you talked about a few instances where that was something that worked out within your time frame. How would we make those opportunities available to somebody else that would say seeking to move up slightly the next level in, in Rotary? Sure. I think one of the most, um, it's a simple answer and one of the most probably important is to uh, let other people know your intentions. Mm -hmm. And okay. you know, by sharing that you have an interest in something beyond what you're currently doing um, with someone, I think when you put your intentions out there, they manifest themselves. And you know, if you're just going to hide your light under a barrel and you know, expect to be tapped for something, you know, it might not happen. And if you, if somebody who is in a position to, um, you know, put you forward as a, a public speaker in an event, or would be interested in knowing that you'd like to have your hand in event management, or um, you want to do public speaking, you know, things like that. If you shared that, you have an opportunity okay. to create to do it. Or possibly just getting more involved. Like you say, Absolutely. a lot of those people that kind of hide behind that, they don't really reach out and they don't take the initiative to get involved more. Yep. Um, I would say we talk about age, we, we talk about bringing in different groups uh, in areas like that in Rotary. Is there a certain area in the world, since you've seen it all, that is more progressive, that has having more success in that than any other part? What's interesting to me is um, certainly traveling to many, many different um, countries over the past couple of years. One of the things that I've definitely had my eyes, kept my eyes open on is how does women female leadership play out in these areas. So for example, um, being in the Middle East, I wanted to see, okay, in my in my mind, not having been to the Middle East, I'm thinking it's probably going to be more male dominated um, in leadership roles. Well I couldn't have been it couldn't have been farther from what I found. And it was it was extraordinarily the dynamic women of their district was just incredible. Um, likewise I was just recently in Taiwan. Again my perception would have been that I would find very traditional um, male-dominated clubs. Again, strong female mm -hmm. leadership, the same in Japan. Mm -hmm. I, and it was interesting, there was a governor in Japan who asked me if he wanted to take me to see this Rotary Club. It was very emphatic that I had to see this Rotary Club. And so I envisioned that I was going to go to the, the, the stately oldest club of the district, you know, the large, probably, lunch club. He took me to a club, and it was all Rotary alumni under the age of 40. Oh, wow. And they were on fire. <laughs> and, they, and it was the conductor of the orchestra, the lead buyer for Tiffany's, a teacher, musicians. It was, a, it was such an eclectic group. And if they, many of them travel, um, if they were away, at that point in time, they were Skyping in um, to the meeting. And so they had that all set, all the technology set up to go and to be able to do that. And it was, it was again, it was one of those, like, okay, I... This was a stereotype that I, I didn't expect to break, and it was very cool to see it that way. And, you know, the world over, what I've really come to see is that everyone is exactly the same. You know, especially, not everyone, Rotarians <laughs> are all the same. Hmm. And the, the heart that we have and the ability to walk into a room and see a person that's a Rotarian and have an automatic affinity for each other, that is an, an amazing, ama that's the power of our organization. And it, it's, it, it, it really blows me away. <laughs> that's great. Outstanding. So Jennifer, we have a few more minutes left. Tell us, what is the most rewarding part of Rotary that you've experienced? Any level? Wow. Um, it's multifaceted. I've, um, I would have to say, the obvious, the friendships, um, certainly that I've gained, the uh, leadership development skills, public speaking skills. I mean, I certainly know that event management, these are all things that I know without question I have become better at because of my capacity of being a leader in Rotary. Um, you know, I think that um, I, I find, I, I feel like I'm a political person, we're a non political organization, but I would never want to run for a municipal office. I found this to fulfill that kind of part of me, and I don't know if that makes sense because it's not doing it for political reasons, but it's an, a, 
an opportunity to actually have my hands be able to touch the world right. in a much bigger way than I could have through a municipal or provincial or national I understand. office. I understand. Since I'm a councilman, I understand yeah, that situation. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, very good point. And so I think that that's, that's been very rewarding. And every single one of my best friends is a Rotarian. True. And um, that's some that I have made through Rotary. Um, and it's also some that have seen how passionate I am about it and have said, I really want to be part of this. Great. And so, and my mom and dad uh, joined, I, I inducted both of them nice. um, over the past couple of years, That's which nice. has been really cool. My mom and I are in the same club and Nick, my husband and my dad are in right. the same club. So. And of course, Nick, uh, your, your best of your best is also a Rotarian. Exactly. <laughs> he, and you know what, and, and unfortunately, this is crazy. I'm not the sponsor of any of the three of them. Oh, really? No. I, I, I installed them, but I, I no. Nick, Nick was asked for about 10 years before he said yes. And my mom, uh, my parents always came to all of our events and everything like this. And some contemporaries that they really became friends with, you know, finally said, you know, you, you want to join? And I was like, oh my gosh, this was right under my nose. Like, how, how could I have not seen this? And then my dad actually... He didn't. He didn't even have somebody ask him. We were having dinner, and he said, "I'd like to be a Rotarian." You know, <laughs> Dad, I, I'm sorry, I've never asked you. Well, I hope that's a lesson learned for you then. It's a, it's, a, it's a lesson learned for all Rotarians. This is true. <laughs> that, that you know, sometimes it's right in front of you, right, and right. and so and it's been a joy to watch what they've gotten out of it. Very good. Well, Jennifer, thank you very much for your time. We sure appreciate it, and I'm yeah. sure the audience is also. It's been a pleasure. Great. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I hope you enjoyed that video. Again, Jennifer Jones, one of the outstanding people in Rotary. She's done tremendous things. She's earned her way to the top by doing just about everything and for the right reason. She's very, very sensitive to what Rotary needs and does. And with that, keep an eye on her because uh, Jennifer is definitely gonna be going places. And with that, thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed the show.